everybody. <laughs> we're live. Okay. Hi, everybody. In case you were feeling nostalgic about what uh, the last three years have been like, <laughs> you land, you got a little bit of a taste. So let me just, let's try this again. Welcome, everybody, to our fifth offering in our Scholars in the Square series. I'm pleased to see people here in person, on Zoom, and in the future through the wonders of YouTube. After a 20-minute talk by Dr. Matt Orr, our friend Matt Humphrey, a local priest, activist, and business owner, will join me for a 20-minute conversation with other Matt. And then we'll spend the last 20 minutes in discussion with the roughly 20 people in the room and whoever else is with us through Zoom. Now, one of the many things I appreciate about the community of scholars, students, and activists at the center is that it's really a model of interdisciplinarity. I love to welcome academics for a wide range of fields from all over the world into conversations with artists, lawyers, doctors, journalists, activists, and members of the broader public. Now, our speaker for today is Dr. Matt Orr, a visiting fellow at the CSRS. Matt's a biologist from Oregon State University Cascades in Bend, Oregon. He's the author of scholarly articles and journals such as Nature, Ecology, the Quarterly Review of Biology, and Zygon, the Journal of Religion and Science. He specializes in behavioral ecology and restoration ecology, but he describes himself as a scientific generalist, which probably explains why his contributions to our center conversation the last little while have been so rich. During his time with us, he's interested in the role religious groups might play in the urgent response to the climate and ecological crises we're all facing. We are very pleased to have Matt with us and to help us learn um, about these complex and imperiled ecosystems. And this learning is just one way we can express our wish to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and the Sanish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And now I'm very happy to turn the podium and the camera over to Matt. Uh, thanks everybody for attending today. Um, and thanks everybody online. Um, and thanks to CSRS for their support and collegiality. Um, I'm uh, an ecologist who works in field systems and scavenging and in restoration ecology. And I also do some uh, theoretical work in microbial gut medicine. Today, I'm gonna to address three questions that start with that go beyond science. The first is what to do about declines in sustainability. Second is what to do about declines in religiosity. And really, those are just a setup for my main question, which is, can crisis bring science and religion together? Um, so this is just one example of sustainability declines. Um, these are tipping point species, which are birds that have lost greater than 50% of their population in the last 50 years. Uh, about 8% of North American birds that are not listed as threatened or endangered qualify as tipping point species. Um, this is uh, a figure that shows religiosity declines in, uh, in the US, so it's church membership. Which button was that? Anyway. Uh, traditional religions in the United States will meet trip, tipping point criteria around 2025 based on current trends. Um, and this is pretty much inevitable, um, given that um, older co age cohorts um, show the highest levels of church attendance. Um, the trends that I showed you for the U.S. are occurring in many countries worldwide. Okay, so my main question based on those declines is can crisis bring science and religion together? Um, and I think this quote maybe summarizes my entire talk. Um, and you'll notice that um, I'm talking about religion and spirituality somewhat interchangeably. And um, that's, that's something we can talk about uh, in the discussion if you want, but for now, uh, just go with it. Okay, so science religion relationships. Um, one is a conflict model. 
There's an independence model, a dialogue model, and an integration model. And these are just different ways that they can relate to each other. Um, from a metaphorical perspective, for many, the uh, religion has uh, lost its uh, traditional utility. Um, and so this bottle is meant to symbolize that as something that provided a use, but is no longer providing that use anymore. It's an empty bottle. From the conflict model perspective, science might happily observe religion's demise. From a dialogue model, religion might shift to recognize scientific knowledge while remaining largely recognizable, like the bottle turned into a vase. And from an integration perspective or an integration <laughs> model, religion becomes less recognizable but retains essential ingredients like a, a bottle that's recycled as glass insulation. And these are the two models that I'm gonna focus on. Um, from the perspective of dialogue and integration, science is actually struggling too. Um, this is the World Scientist pointing to humanity. In 1992, it had 1,700 signatories, and they said human beings in the natural world are on a collision course. 25 years later, we now have 20,000 signatories, um, and it says humanity has failed to make sufficient progress in generally solving these foreseen environmental challenges, and alarmingly, most of them are getting far worse. This was essentially predicted by the historian Lynn White Jr. in the pages of the journal Science in 1967, when he wrote, more science and more technology are not going to get us out of the present ecologic crisis until we find a new religion or rethink our old one. Uh, Lynn White's assertion was really uh, sort of a special case of a wider pattern that was first um, described by anthropologist Anthony Wallace, uh, who was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania who specialized in Native American cultures. And in his book, uh, Religion, an Anthropological Perspective, he wrote, from the known diversity of values among various cultures, it can readily be deduced that religion should vary from one society to another, depending on the values necessary for that society's integration and survival. Um, and in a 1956 paper titled Revitalization Movements, he defined a revitalization movement as a deliberate, organized, conscious effort by members of a society to construct a more satisfying culture. And he contrasted that with what he considered mm -hmm. not to be re revitalization where he wrote, the classic processes of culture change, evolution, drift, diffusion, and culturation all produce changes in cultures as systems. However, they do not depend on deliberate intent by members of a society, but rather on a chain reaction effect. Introducing A induces change in B, changing B affects C. When C shifts, A is modified, and so on, ad infinitum. He wrote in the same paper, our files now contain reference to several hundred religious revitalization movements among both Western and non-Western peoples on five continents. Those are some of the ones he listed. And in addition, a recent CSRS lecture by Philip Jenkins talking about climate catastrophe and faith actually had a number of examples of what would be considered re or could be considered revitalization movements based on climate, sh climate shifts throughout history. Um, so Wallace's overall sort of cycle of revitalization starts with um, a steady state in which social stress varies within tolerable limits. Um, disruption from sources such as climate, flora and faunal change, military defeat or epidemics, and those are the examples he listed among a few others, lead to a period of increased stress. That's not attended to, it can then lead to what he called a period of cultural distortion. And I would assert that global society is either in or entering into um, what could be considered a period of cultural distortion. Um, and the <coughs> symptoms are listed there below and I'm gonna go into them in more detail now. So the first symptom of cultural distortion that Wallace listed was indolence, passivity, depression, self-reproach, 
psychosomatic and neurotic disorders. We have the recently formed Climate Psychology and Climate Psychiatry Alliances in North America that deal with this. In addition, there are a host of new terms and titles to deal with this rise. And in addition to that, academia is giving a lot of attention to the subject as the review paper. The second symptom of cultural distortion is intra-group violence. So that's violence within a group. Um, this is a paper from 2013 in Science that reviewed 60 studies of 45 conflict data sets from 10,000 BC to the present. For every one standard deviation rise in temperature, they found that in interpersonal conflicts rose an average of 4% and multi-person conflicts rose 14%. So if that translates, and maybe it doesn't, maybe it does to what we uh, see coming based on um, climate change models, uh, that would translate into an eight to 16% rise in interpersonal conflicts and 28 to 56% rise in multi-person conflicts by 2050. Third symptom is irresponsibility in public officials. Um, <laughs> now we could give a seminar on that, but I'm just gonna leave it at <laughs> your favorite official here. <laughs> Fourth symptom of cultural distortion. This is one that I find to be perhaps the most interesting is cultural elements are mutually inconsistent and interfering. And we see that at a political level. We're now seeing that cross-generationally. Here's a specific example. Since the 1970s, there has been inconsistency and interference between ExxonMobil and its own scientists. The black there shows ExxonMobil scientists' models. The red is observed temperatures and the models are, have turned out to be quite accurate. Those models are from the mid seventies. And ExxonMobil itself within its own documents um, shows that internally, so these are just the left-hand column from about 1976 to 2015, their internal documents uh, acknowledge that climate change is real and human caused as shown by green bars. Um, but they're what, are, what the authors of this article called their advertorials, which are paid for sort of advertisements um, put into uh, mainstream media sources, um, particularly starting in the 1990s, were constantly raising doubt about climate. Okay, so this raises the question of how have cultures historically exited periods of cultural distortion? And by Wallace's sort of scheme here, it's through what he called a period of revitalization in which individuals reformulate their maze way or their image of nature, society, culture, personality, and body image, or the society dies. And he wrote, I need your magic touch over here. <laughs> the historical origin of a great proportion of religious phenomena has been in revitalization movements. Hmm. All right. So this leads to the question, will dialogue and integration between science and religion foster revitalization? <coughs> and we, we see now that every major religion now has a faith statement on ecology that fits the definition of a maze way adjustment. So just for example, Christianity talks about a radical rethinking of what it means to be Christian and a struggle to reconcile centuries of human-centered Christian teaching with the truths that the environmentalists are telling us. <clears throat> Similarly, Pope Francis in his 2015 encyclical letter started it by saying, I will begin by briefly reviewing several aspects of the present ecological crisis with the aim of drawing on the results of the best scientific research available today, letting them touch us deeply and provide a concrete foundation for the ethical and spiritual itinerary that follows. Okay, but <clears throat> and, and there's a lot of examples like that, but I want to shift, uh, just given the limited time, to this question, is rethinking traditional religions enough?
Um, and there's a conundrum, which is historically religions have helped societies to overcome crises. But during the first known global crisis in human history, religion is in steep decline. So this raises the question, could something akin to religious recycling inspire environmental protection among those who have left or never had traditional religion? And so to answer this, and so this is sort of like that recycling thing from the earlier slide. So to answer this, uh, we could think about what are the raw materials that go into religion? And one way of doing that is by looking at a definition of religion, a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies, usually de involving devotional and ritual observance, and often having a moral code for the conduct of human affairs. Okay, so let's go through these, what, what, I, you know, what I'm calling raw materials of religion uh, one at a time. So as far as the superhuman is concerned, the same dictionary defines superhuman as above or beyond what is human, having a higher nature or greater powers than man has. And that is important to contrast with supernatural, which is above or beyond what is natural, unexplainable by natural law or phenomena. Supernatural excludes science because science doesn't deal with the supernatural. But, but superhuman does not necessarily exclude science and therefore perhaps invites a certain level of integration. What does it matter whether the curses of a conscious deity or the superhuman laws of physics, chemistry, and biology to set us with fire, famine, floods, and extinction in exchange for bad behavioral choices? From a functional perspective, it makes no difference. Consequences are consequences, regardless of whether the agency that inflicts them is superhuman or supernatural. Okay, what about this part of the definition, cause and nature of the universe? So I'm gonna go through three from different areas of science. So in terms of geology and paleontology, there have been five <clears throat> major extinctions over 3.7 billion years of life on earth but humans are creating a six mass extinction and a new epoch um, that we all know is called the Anthropocene. In terms of ecology, humans rely on nature for their well-being, but for example, half of Earth's corals have died since 1950. The Eastern Amazon is now a carbon source rather than a carbon sink. In terms of evolution, there's a mismatch between our Stone Age minds and modern environments. So this is the third sort of element of the cause and nature of the universe. Um, and this mismatch in the face of this slide has created um, a lot of chronic uh, diseases in human populations as a consequence of industrial food. Um, and in terms of another mismatch, um, we do, our brains don't detect carbon emissions, which is a big reason why we've been unable to deal with climate change. Um, and this is a website that's devoted to dealing with that cognitive handicap by visualizing carbon. Each one of those little spheres is a one ton uh, sphere of carbon dioxide gas. There was one day of carbon emissions from New York City in that picture. See a bigger one later. Uh, <clears throat> food taboos or taboos in general might be another way of dealing with, uh, a, might be a devotional observance of sort that might be another way of dealing with some of our cognitive handicaps. So for instance, a global transition to a more plant-based diet could reduce food-related greenhouse gas emissions by 30 to 70% and global mortality by six to 10%. Yet despite this alignment of human and planetary health, global meat consumption appears on track to increase 62 to 144% by 2050. Um, so all of this I think winds into a sort of a, or could at least, if people so ch chose, um, be interpreted into a moral code for the conduct of human affairs. So in sum, a scientific understanding of our origins engenders humility for human recency, gratitude for natural capital, and self-awareness of our primitive brains. And there's one year of carbon emissions for New York City. Uh, I just wanna raise one other quote. This is from Jane Goodall. Where she, wrote, my real, where she writes, my real fear is that we've become apathetic because of, what have I, because of what I call just meism. I mean, I'm one person, there's millions of people out there 
actually billions. So what little I do can't possibly make any difference. It's just me. For that, I think we could maybe um, rethink the idea of faith um, into something that's more akin to simply belief that our actions matter. Um, and this is different from versions of faith that rely on belief in something supernatural or versions of blind faith that lead people to disregard science. <clears throat> uh, this is an exercise in ecological restoration. Uh, I've been involved in a few of these and I see these, you know, a lot of these are exercises in faith in terms of putting in an effort and seeing what happens. Okay, so this is my next to last slide. This is a quote from a book about ecological restoration. It's actually the book that got me into the field um, because I found it so inspiring. Um, and I think the quote shows um, kind of a, a nice combination of the idea of faith as I'm conceiving it, plus um, community, and plus what uh, the center might call reverential naturalism. Okay, so it reads, and then one day it dawned on him that no, if the prairies were to survive, he needed congregations, as he started calling them, of people who could interact with the land, who could develop an emotional bond with it. And I'll leave you with this quote from Emil Durkheim. If we have some difficulty today imagining these festivals and ceremonies of the future, that is because we are in a period of transition and moral mediocrity. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the next 20 minutes we're gonna spend in conversation. And when we imagine this um, new structure, we try to imagine giving people on, in, in Zoom land, but also people in the room, a bit of an insight into what our daily coffee sessions are like. Uh, I think Matt knows what they're like quite well and, and you've visited them too. So it means that we need to invite somebody who's a good, conversational partner who isn't going to be adversarial, but also who comes from a particular you know, space of expertise. And so Matt certainly does. So I'll let you uh, ask the first question. I'm here to just moderate uh, okay. because we can choose somebody who's smarter than me and more able to have conversations about what the <laughs> speaker is, is up to, uh, but I'm here to just kind of keep things buoyant. Well, Matt, before you ask a question, can you just say what you do? Yeah. Because you're, you're, I'm, I'm excited to be I'm okay. talking with you, but partly because of what you do. So thank you. Maybe the audience should know too. Sure. So um, yeah, thank you for your talk and lovely to be in conversation. Um, we had a great yeah. coffee chat and continued over lunch and a rich dialogue. Um, so yeah, I, I have a mixed a set of things that I do. I am an ordained uh, priest in the Anglican tradition. I serve a small community here in Victoria part-time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I work as one of the uh, partner owners of a small local uh, grocery store called the local general store on Halting. Come visit us. <laughs> um, and I've worked uh, in environmental nonprofits for the better part of 10 or 15 years in both in and out of the church. Um, so yeah, I think I bring, uh, you know, I've got skin in the game for your topic. Uh, and I come at it from within a particular tradition and yet also aware, uh, you know, that those charts so many of the um, traditions have been facing those, those kind of charts for so long. And I think that's what's the most striking to me is the conundrum that you raised about two thirds of the way through that at the time we're facing one of our greatest global crises. Some of those institutions that maybe have thrived in crisis are themselves slipping. And I think that's, um, that's maybe my first question is what you've constructed your proposal and I wanna talk about the metaphors and kind of play with some poetry because I know we can have fun with that. But I, I think it's a question around what we do, how we would, how we would build uh, the kind of institutions to respond to what you're suggesting. I think, uh, you know, you, you quoted from the Pope's encyclical, there's a new one out just last week, right? Even more intense language um, and, and great to see that. Um, but not a lot of people look to the Catholic Church for their basis of their their moral life. So how do we think about how do we think about this conundrum in light of um, you know a, a lack of trust in institutions, which I share as someone who's a part of an institution? Do you have any thoughts on that to get us going? Um, 
I, I guess one thought I've had around it is the idea um, that's been pretty prominent lately, uh, at least within uh, the United States and within my academic culture, I assume it has been here too, which is the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think you're, you're probably quite successful at what you're doing with your, um, your Anglican group. I, um, so you didn't say that you've also, you did a little bit of training, right? Mm -hmm. um, in seminary around ecological issues. Mm -hmm. And you probably have a, a, a group that is dedicated and, um, you know, is quite successful within that group of people. And, um, and I think, you know, looking at what the Pope's done also, um, trying to broaden uh, Catholic perspectives with, with ecology. Um, there's the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology that, um, I don't know if people are aware of that site, but that has a lot of information on how religions in general are becoming more ecological. And I see all those as just like 100% positive signs. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of greater inclusivity, mm -hmm. I think um, there are perhaps ways of either drawing people back in who have left their churches mm -hmm. or of drawing people in who might not have considered themselves religious to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, and so that's sort of what I'm trying to get at with my talk. I, I wanted to both highlight what religion is doing, which is very positive, but also think about how do you make it more inclusive um, for people who don't think of them either, maybe don't think of themselves as traditionally religious. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, so that's a sort of an abstract answer to your question maybe in more concrete terms is maybe religious spaces could be inviting other groups in to use those spaces that are that are at least aligned and we talked a lot so Matt and I went out to lunch a couple of days ago and we talked a lot about the idea of like not focusing too much on the micro differences and getting together and focusing on the end goal and so you know that and, and I guess from that perspective it would mean you know, re religion, religions have such a great sort of infrastructure about them. They have these beautiful buildings. Um, they have endowments. Um, they've got a lot of resources. And so perhaps in part, um, you know, using those resources to kind of try to pull more people in and actually perhaps benefit themselves, right, by, by, widening maybe not necessarily their congregation but maybe maybe their congregation so i've read you know i've also read people suggest just go back to your church and suggest that you want to be working more on environmental issues mm -hmm. right like like people should actually be steering their church mm -hmm. we talked a little bit when we went out to lunch too about age differences and i showed that age cohort diagram of people from below need to be kind of taking over and redirecting. Um, and, you know, you can say the same thing about politics at a certain level too. Can I interfere? Yeah. <laughs> Slash interrupt. Um, so, but we've talked a lot at the center, as, as you know, about that, the trajectory that you sketched a little bit. It's even worse in Canada. It's a steeper trajectory uh, in terms of deinstitutionalization and secularization. So do you, are you imagining that people would return to institutions that they've given up on maybe even a couple of generations before? In other words, it was their parents or their grandparents who gave up on these institutions. Is a climate crisis enough of a crisis or the right kind of crisis to draw people back to institutions that either they themselves or their parents or grandparents left? So <clears throat> this is where I think this idea of like diversity and not like a one size fits all solution is really important. <laughs> because there's a whole range of spiritualities across the planet and religions across the planet. And there's never been, and like, you should be extremely skeptical of anybody that comes to you and says, this is the true religion, right? That, that's the person that most of us would be running away from. And so, um, and so I think when you ask that question, I could answer it by interpreting the word institution two ways. So when you ask, would people return to these religious institutions that they've left? Some might return to the institution. Some might just return to the building that's being also used mm -hmm. by people whose spirituality is slightly different or, 
or who have adopted maybe some of these, what I would, what I would consider to be more naturalistic views of religion. Um, and then ultimately, you know, those people are in the same building together at some point, perhaps. And, and again, it's all, it's all coming together over a common cause and not sweating the details so much. And I think that's an important thing that maybe humans have had trouble doing over time in terms of differences in religions or spiritualities. But um, again, it goes back to that quote that I love to talk with, which is that necessity, not virtue, is the source of my spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at this point where necessity, hopefully, is going to start pulling people together because it's going to take a lot of pulling in the same direction. Yeah, I think I, I appreciate that quote and wanted to respond to that. I think what's a, it gets at one of the hearts, I think, of what you're working on, and that is the question of religion and utility. Like, what, what is this doing? What is this serving? And the notion that necessity drives it. Um, I mean, we could get, I think we could get maybe a little sidelined in an academic discussion of utility of religion. Um, whereas my experience kind of work in the day to day, it is to some extent, some folk are finding their way wandering back in to the edges of the institution, the community I'm a part of. It's, I should say, I mean, I'm an ordained Anglican, but we're a shared Anglican and United Church ministry. And a lot of folk find their way uh, to us who can't stomach a lot of churches and don't want a part of it and have been very hurt by it. And we're living in a time of a, a deep reckoning with the mixed legacy at best the church has given. Um, I loved your I loved your image of the bottle because I think what I'm experiencing right the utility of the bottle um, it of course it's made of glass and you could do other things with the glass but but ultimately right it's um, it's containing a liquid and I think the I think the error that religions have made certainly the ones I'm a part of is to think we somehow contain this substance it's it's ours um, and I and I think my sense is that folk are are thirsty for something. Um, they're maybe not trusting a lot of the bottles that it comes in, uh, but there's a real there's a real live space for that. And we had we had a great coffee talk the other day. You led us through some poetry from from uh, Robert Frost. I think looking at responding to that sense of that um, superhuman world, right? That there is something other than us out there. How we name that, how we call that, uh, I think. There's a lot of rich discussion you know, that happens in the center around how we do that with respect and with care for one another. Um, I wanted to like, relay one story and then I think shift up to some questions. I was part of a dialogue a couple years ago in Abbotsford with Eddie Stalo, who's or Eddie Gardner, who's a Stalo elder. And he was telling the story of, um, of Whale Rock, which is on Harrison Lake. It's a huge rock. And if you look from right above, it looks like a whale. And he told this story, it's, it's his traditional story, not mine, of, of a whale that followed the salmon upriver and was warned not to do so, was warned, no, the salmon that come up the river are for humans, the whales eat the salmon in the sea. And eventually, this back and forth happens between this whale and the creator, and the whale is, is frozen in rock as this kind of warning, right? And he told this as a, as a traditional story that gives warning to not overconsume. And I was sitting and I said, you know, we have a funny story in, in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament about the people uh, in the desert collecting manna and they get tired of manna and they say, we want meat, we demand meat. And so then the response, the creator says, fine, you want meat, I'll give you meat. And it says there's six cubits of meat, which is something like 10 feet of meat fill the camp, right? So it, this is a certain kind of story. And the people all, all start to perish and get sick from overconsumption and the place is, is called in the scriptures, it's called the graves of craving, for they, you know, they crave too much. And it was this interesting moment of saying we have, we have a lot of rich stories that come out of rich, diverse traditions that help us to face things like our overconsumption, things like how we relate. And uh, I, I think part of what you're pointing us to is to say, how would we bring those stories forward? How would we include dialogue among one another's stories at a time when uh, we need them perhaps more than ever? So. I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts on that. We certainly probably are almost time to open up for questions. Uh, yeah, I do have some thoughts on that. Um, I like what you said about, well, I like the, the whole thing that you said there about two stories that are similar that lead to a similar conclusion. And 
the idea of people getting together from different traditions or different backgrounds, maybe even including outside of religion, mm -hmm. um, and thinking about mm -hmm. how to come up with whatever they are, stories or metaphors that inspire them, um, that, that inspire their behavior. And um, we also talked about at lunch the idea of, in Buddhism of a hungry ghost, which is something that has a really small head and a giant body and it can never get enough to satisfy its hunger. Um, and just to tie that back to um, maybe something that would, that somebody from outside of science might find, uh, sorry, that somebody from outside of religion might find interesting, sort of a segue to get them thinking in a spiritual way. There's a book uh, called Why Buddhism is True. Can't remember the author right now. Do you know? Um, and anyway, he he comes at Buddhism from a, from an evolutionary perspective, like I was talking about in my talk. Um, and and he says, you know, if 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 an organism was going to be designed by evolution to survive and reproduce, how would you design its mind? And basically, the idea was, well, you would design it to have these cravings or desires for things that it needed fundamentally like appetite and reproduction. Um, and then you would also design it such that even though it had those cravings, it wouldn't be particularly satisfied by them because if it got overly satisfied, then it wouldn't go out and find the next meal uh, or it might not go out and find the next mate. And so um, basically he's making the point there of like this whole idea of dealing with your cravings, which is a big piece of Buddhism. And, goes back to the idea of hungry ghosts is uh, so Buddhism there as a way of kind of um, overcoming our innately cognitive, uh, our innate cognitive programming. Um, and, and I think there's a really important piece of that there. Um, it's something that science, you know, science can point maybe some of these ideas out, but it definitely isn't a piece of science um, for how to deal with them. Um, there's a philosopher named Mary Midgley who said, um, how to live was never a part of science or something to that effect. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to translate some of this knowledge into inspiration. I think inspiration is a big piece of it. Not just saying what we should be doing, but actually inspiring ourselves to do it. Um, so, thanks. I don't know if that answered your question. That's a start. That was a great answer. Yeah, that was a great answer. I think by way of an introduction to the next part of the conversation, which is where we all join the table again, um, where we'll keep the intimate tone, but broaden the uh, number of people in the, in the conversation. Um, I wonder if you could give us some sense of how you came around to this line of research and writing. Um, what's a nice guy like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are all so nice. I know. Well, Why we're also Canadians. It's not, it's yeah. not fair. Better so, yet. Better yeah. yet. Um, so, yeah, I actually ended up with this interest. Um, so some of the stuff that was in this talk came out of some papers that I published in Zygon Journal of Science and Religion back in like 2003 and 2005. And so that was a long time ago. Um, I was a postdoc at the time, and I, and I was actually, I was working with um, invasive species. I, I was on a project that, where we were um, studying parasitic flies down in South America as possible biological control agents for ants that had arrived in North America. And um, was beginning to realize just how difficult it is to deal with invasive species, like once, the invasive species is out of the bottle, so to speak. It's very hard to stuff it back in. And realizing on a wider scale how even though, even, ask, even scientific knowledge is not necessarily always enough to solve a problem. Um, and so we could go down and study these ants and flies and you know, look at how they interacted, but that wasn't necessarily in the end gonna cure the problem. And, and I just started to feel like there's a lot more, and, and I was very, I guess I've always for some reason been very interested in conservation and concerned about the state of the planet. And so I just started to think more broadly about it. 
um, it didn't seem like it was enough to just think about science. Um, and, and that's what got me interested in just reading more and thinking, trying to think through it more. And, um, and also, I guess maybe to a certain extent, you know, there's a lot of people out there thinking about religion and there's a lot of people out there thinking about science and there aren't a lot of people out there thinking about, well, how do you pull the two together? And so it just seemed like a very interesting like endeavor to, to try to think about how, how you pull the two together and what it would mean to do that. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, so now we're opening the floor to conversation. Uh, so I would ask those of you who are going to be at the center tomorrow for our traditional tease out session to perhaps defer to those others in the room who won't be there with us and to people on Zoom. Um, so we'll take questions from the room. I'm, I'm thinking, I can see Patricia writing questions during, during the talk, but uh, so Gary. Thanks so much, that was stunning. I'm really curious to know whether you foresee any developments in biology that will play a role in integrating life sciences with religion more fully. Because as an outsider who tries to follow this a little bit, it's my general impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the sort of neo-Darwinist view of life as this improbable accident is beginning to give way to a kind of Dennis Noble view of systems theory and that life is actually not quite as improbable. And so do you foresee changes in understanding of evolution that will make this integration more possible than it is under a sort of straightforward neo-Darwinist model? Great question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gary. Um, I guess I'd have to say, not to my knowledge. Um, I don't know the person you just referred to. He's written a book, he's at Cambridge. Um, he's written a book called Dance to the Tune of Life, and he's had a long-term debate with Dawkins. He's basically, since the 70s, been saying Dawkins has got it wrong, and he's been so, he's a fairly big internet presence. So he's not a minor figure, he's like, you know. he's Yeah, awesome. I mean, I, I actually would, uh, Richard Dawkins um, is a super smart guy and he's been very good about educating people about evolution. I would say one place where maybe I would diverge from him is um, I, I don't think that you can scientifically assert atheism. Um, I don't think it's not within the realm of science to try to say whether a divine being exists. Um, maybe someday it will be. But for now, science can't really tell us one way or the other whether there's a, there's a higher divinity out there. And certainly Einstein believed that there was something bigger out there that we don't understand. And so, um, so yeah, I don't come from the perspective of, um, you know, there's, there, there's nothing beyond what we see in front of us. But also, I do think that a lot of what we see in front of us can be interpreted to certain conclusions, such as, Life is diversified through evolution, mostly by evolution by natural selection. Um, so uh, let's see, there was another thing that you got me thinking about when you asked your question. Uh, oh, about things about biology that could kind of come together with spirituality. So this is maybe not the, the answer you expect, but um, I, I alluded a little bit to ecological restoration. And I'm actually, Surprisingly, I was really surprised to hear that Matt, um, do you want to really briefly describe your experience with, with ecological restoration at that place where you were working? Uh, Rosha? Yeah, I worked at a, a small um, NGO that uh, participated in, you know, we did clean up Saturdays and, and restoration uh, projects. Was there some particular piece that you... It's called Arosha, right? It's called Arosha, yeah. Yeah, and, right. and is it, and can you just say something about what that was, what Arosha was? Yeah, so Arosha is one of the few faith-based environmental organizations that works in about 25 countries around the world, has been around for 40 years, um, and is in Canada and just outside Vancouver and as well as um, Manitoba and Ontario. And so, yeah, it's sort of part, um, like people with degrees in science working on restoration, working on salmon habitats and other things, some small scale sustainable farming, which is part of the piece I was interested in, and then education, working with school groups and children and the like. So that's some of my. Uh, so there are scientists and people that are interested in more spiritual perspective out there in the field together yeah. at these sites. Yeah. Okay, so there's, I mean, I know maybe that's not what you were, you were driving at, but like, I think there's so much potential 
So even those slides I showed right at the end of that restoration site, there was one day we were out there and there was a mindfulness group out there doing ecological restoration. And every 10 minutes or so, they'd, they'd ring a little chime just to make sure everybody was like <laughs> pulling weeds and planting plants mindfully. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of potential crossover. Um, maybe at some point, science will somehow prove beyond the shadow of a doubt the existence of a divinity. If it does, um, who knows what that divinity will be? Yeah, um, I, was, I wasn't thinking so much about proving God, but Noble's point is that once you've got a, a biological system reaching a particular level of complexity, you start getting down top down causation. So there's almost a return to a certain kind of notion of Aristotelian telos that's coming back into his biological theory. So that when you have an enclosed system, it wants to move intentionally towards a particular direction. Once you have that kind of return to a kind of different form of like Aristotelian thinking, then we're in a different moment. Like it's a completely different ball game, right? It's not God, but it's meaning, it's structure, it's intentionality, it's consciousness, right? And so I'm just curious to know whether like- Are you talking about that coming from within life or from within diversity or? With, yeah, within life, within biological- In terms systems. of how like a, an ecosystem might change over time or something like that? Well, in an individual species is, 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 is as far as I understand it, how, how it plays Or how out. a species might evolve, so, mm -hmm. but it still would be evolution. It was absolutely evolution, but it's it's natural selection is not the only mechanism. That was his whole point. He's He's been critical of the idea that natural selection is the only mm -hmm. mechanism. Well, it's uh, maybe an analog for your work from the other day, right? Is is we see both um, with competition, but also mutualism, right? Within some of the things that you've studied, and I think some of that, some of that data, right? Some of the stuff that we're learning about, um, you know, the way that trees function underground, like it, it, it cuts against the purely um, survival mm. Darwinian narrative, right? And exactly. you start to see there's a there's an intelligence in the system that probably a certain generation of scientists would have rejected as not possible. Yeah. Um, I think your work probably shows a bit of that as well. There's a little bit on group selection now too that goes against, mm -hmm. but but still the, even the even the group level selection. I mean, we're going to get pretty academic and egg hitty here if we're, if we're not careful. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I guess I guess ultimately I would just say I'm not. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, the, the stuff about the underground group networks are pretty crazy too, what's going on there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that you could, you could, I'm not sure it's been shown for sure that there's not a level of self-interest going on there among those species, even though they appear to be integrated, there's probably some benefits to that level of integration. So yeah, I guess I just, I don't really know the answer to that. Thank you. Or, I mean, there's uh, in, what I was thinking of when you were asking that question and, and hearing your reflections too is sort of the Gaia hypothesis, the mm -hmm. sense that you can, you can imagine a, a kind of intelligence at work within a complex system. However, that complex system gets to be complex is a, in some sense, a question one can set to the side for a moment. Same thing with Suzanne Samara's book and Finding the Mother Tree with the complex mm -hmm. story of the way trees and other, other uh, organisms interact. There's a kind of a complex intelligence there. Um, and but you're still you're still a bit um, concerned that it might still just be survival of the fittest or a concern for my being as a cedar and so it makes sense for me to make friends with an alder I'm, make, I'm making you an alder now <laughs> yeah um, I guess one thing I'd ask is um, you know if, if you're concerned about I mean there's there's two ways of looking at this so if you're concerned about the environmental crisis and nature and saving nature, I'm not sure that question matters that much. If you're concerned about what's your religious perspective or your spiritual perspective about being out in nature and trying to understand it from something that has some support from science, I think your question starts to become really interesting. And so, um, but, you know, I guess I would just say maybe I might not be the best person to ask that because I'm not really very knowledgeable of that, of some of those um, recent um, discoveries. And, um, and I think, you know, there's times when things seem like they might be one thing, but, you know, over time, they're not really supported. Right. So, but I do think that you're raising an interesting point about, um, you know, even within science, being able to revise our views about how we think about nature. Um, and it kind of goes along with what I'm saying about um, religion, which is, um, you know, part, I think part of the reason religion has lost its, um, 
mean, authority is maybe not a great word to use there, but it's popularity, let's say, is because it hasn't always questioned itself. It has become entrenched in ideology. And so, you know, I think science can do that too, but like over the long term, often, you know, the truth comes out, even if initially science is like be skeptical of something. So, um, so yeah, I, I'll actually, you've got me interested in looking more into some of those ideas. If you have a book in mind, I, I'd like to get that from you afterwards. So Patricia, Lane, and then Rory. Uh, so I was wondering for the three of you actually, uh, Hi. Um, it seems to me that you move from three to four when human needs get, um, or, or part of your thesis is that, that the, there's a drive to move from three to four. Um, and so there's some energy around that. And so I think that there is a new religion, new spirituality that's been created to meet the needs that a 50, 60 year period of neoliberalism has taught us that we have and that can be thought of as conspirituality you know the whole QAnon stuff and you know millions of people spend more time with Steve Bannon on his podcast than they spend with their kids every week like mm -hmm. millions of people and so I think that that is feeding into there is revitalization going on but it's pretty dark it's built around a concept that we've been all taught to absorb, which is that we are alone and it is up to us. And those of us who have strong immune systems, we're gonna be fine. And, you know, that whole sort of um, individual. And, and so you juxtapose that with a church or a religion that says, no, 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 we all want, we, we wanna be collective here. But people say, well, we don't, see religion solving the problems that we have or even saying that they're going to. And so churches are no longer providing housing or health care. I mean, the Catholic Church grew to prominence in North America in part because it provided health care in schools. And churches aren't doing that. And neither are other religions for the most part. Um, and so um, I'm interested to know how what you think is the driver that might lead to a period of revitalization that I or people like me with my value set I'm not making assumptions about you would see as positive because I think there's too big a gap for us to be saying well you know I'm part of the Anglican and sometimes the United tradition and it's true every service I go to is all about this new stuff right mm -hmm. but it's not really comforting the afflicted in the way that affects the, you know, people's ability to pay rent or put food on the table. And I read a statistic yesterday that one in four Canadians is not eating enough now. They're actually doing without food. But I don't see churches, I mean, there's food banks in lots of churches, but I don't see the leadership of churches addressing that. At, or even pretending that they can even try to address that at a leadership systemic level that would pull people back in to say, well, I'm afflicted and here's some comfort that I can achieve. But I do see that rhetoric coming out of the right wing. So I just wonder what your thoughts were about all that. And Paul's work on yoga touches this. And Matt's work on, you know, the, the uh, Earth Church, that kind of stuff. I, and I'm really interested. Yeah, well, I, I guess you've raised some questions that go beyond the environmental crisis. Um, I think, uh, which I think are appropriate to raise. Um, we have a lot more going on than just environmental problems, and um, you know, I, I think it's it's hard. You know, obviously, it's a difficult question, but. Um, some of the same sort of social forces that have made it very difficult to solve our environmental problems are forces that I think have been helped to marginalize a lot of people. Um, and so we have a lot of consolidation of wealth. We have a lot of 
collaboration between industry and government. Um, we have, I think, um, some pretty serious problems with our, with what we would like to call our democratic institutions. And so, you know, to the extent that I can answer your question, which goes beyond, you know, an environmental crisis, it does still get at this issue of uh, we're all in this together. Um, and there's, there is a lot of work within environmental movements to try to integrate social justice with environmentalism. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that, and I think there, I think there's a pretty large extent to which these problems share some common root causes. Um, again, it's, you know, what, what is it that brings people together? And, um, and so, you know, the more people can recognize commonalities um, and the more people have, you know, have some sort of place to go with it um, and can create community around it. And so like one thing that Bill McKibben, somebody asked, I don't know if you guys hear much about Bill McKibben up here in Canada, but he's sort of a, he's sort of one of the leading um, activists around climate change. And uh, I've heard it, that somebody asked him, you know, what's the, what's the one thing that I should do if I'm concerned about the environment? And, and he said, uh, join a group. There's this idea of community. And so I, I guess in terms of trying to answer your question, um, if, if you're, to the extent that these problems share a common root cause, um, things that facilitate community around them, whether it's, you know, um, the inequitable distribution of wealth in society. And then of course, the way that that consolidates power and then the way that consolidated power de-democratizes the world and leads to a lot of environmental problems. I think the more you can get people seeing these issues um, as interconnected, um, which is of course, another ecological the theme from ecology is how connected <clears throat> things are. Um, and then perhaps even, um, because I think to some extent, a lot of that conspir conspiratorial thinking is egged on by people who benefit from that divisiveness. And so, um, you know, if we can come together and realize that we, we share a lot of concerns in common, um, then that, that's, a, that's perhaps one way of, of thinking about it. Um, and, 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 and downplaying these kinds of differences that might be, you know, might've been religious differences at one time, but today are more the kinds of differences that you're talking about. Um, and, and, and helping people realize that those are distractions from what the real problem is and maybe how to go about solving it. Thanks. So uh, let's go to one last question from Rory who is going to ask this question in the form of a haiku. <laughs> okay. uh, well, actually, I could quote uh, Rumi, which is oh, maybe no, kind yeah. of, I would. That's close yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's as, as good as I can do. Um, well, Rumi has this uh, saying, uh, don't get drunk off of any old wine. You know, find the best stuff in the universe. You know, Jesus' donkey was drunk off of barley, and Jesus was, was drunk on God. But it raises to me this question of spiritual experience. And if you're isolating what elements of religion could contribute to this revitalization? I, I would, you know, be drawn to this question of spiritual experience because of its potential utility to give people a, a direct encounter with interconnectedness, but also to inspire some of these, these changes. So I wanted to just ask if you've considered or looked at this question of spiritual experience in your own work in terms of religion revitalization. So spiritual experience as opposed to or as something distinct from a religious experience is that what you mean yeah i mean even the bottle analogy i was thinking of you know what's in the bottle you know religion used to carry something and and arguably one of the things that it carried was this kind of spiritual experience and and so i think that's definitely related with the decline of traditional religions and now people get that experience in yoga or psychedelics or they find it elsewhere but that fundamental thirst for this this direct experience i think is something that is a really important factor here as well so. 
It's a wonderful last question. So go ahead. Um, well, not to sound too much like a broken record, um, but like going back to this idea of integrating some really simple practices that maybe aren't normally considered to be religious. So for instance, you know, you're instead of showing up at church one day, you show up with your group um, at an ecological restoration site. And you learn about the plants there, you learn about the history of disturbance, and then you get your hands dirty and you work together as a group and you put life and in, back into the soil. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the, the, so I guess what I'm saying is, is that a lot of people come, come into environmentalism with a background in spiritual experiences in nature. And so maybe those aren't the people you're thinking about with your question. Um, and so if you were to see religion, either, either just regular traditional religions or maybe some new version, uh, moving more in the direction of getting people out into nature, educating them about nature, maybe mm -hmm. even including natural history courses for people that are in theological seminary, um, educating them more about, um, about issues that they can then pass on to their congregation or, or better yet, because this is all a big thing in education now too. And almost every course I teach now has a field component, but then that's sort of the analogy is the lecture versus mm -hmm. being out in the field. Exactly. So bringing that, bringing maybe more of that into people's efforts to go and, and get spiritual experiences. Well, that was good. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, refer to McKibben and his emphasis on the group, because I think in some sense what we try to model at the center is creating a, a group context in which we can puzzle through things intellectually, but also kind of bear witness to some of the, I think, deeper challenges, I think, that animate much of our research. So thanks very much. The next talk is not until the 26th of October, uh, Thursday, same time, same place. So see you all, see you all in there. Take care, everyone.